Moreton Bay Regional Council and CPR Group acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country where we walk, where we work, live, and also where we play. Uh, we recognise the continuing connection uh, to land, waters and culture and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Importantly, I'd like to extend this respect specifically to any First Nations people who join us online tonight. So this evening is uh, represents the second session in a series of education and training workshops that are being provided by Moreton Bay Regional Council at no cost to community organisations across the region. And this follows a session that we facilitated on uh, the 29th of March. So a few weeks ago now, the recording of which is available for viewing at some links that we'll share with you this evening and links that you've probably all already got uh, readily to hand. And that session provided a high level introduction and overview of this disaster resilience program that council are facilitating in support of community organizations and tonight is a little bit of a deeper dive into the how to into the resources the action plan template itself the disaster resilience action plan as well as some of the complementary resources the appendices and and posters and so on to make your life as uh, administrative volunteers within local sport, recreation and community organisations a little easier when it comes to getting prepared for natural disasters. The recording of tonight's workshop will also be made available for those who aren't able to join us for the live session here tonight. So if you would prefer for your video not to appear in the recording, you're more than welcome to turn your camera off. The recording will show just the active speaker in the top right corner. So if you uh, if you're involved in the discussion in tonight's session and you have your camera off, a little black box will appear in place of uh, your video feed. So having said that, if you're happy enough to be included in the recording, you're more than welcome to leave your camera rolling. And towards the end of the session, we'll probably um, turn off the screen sharing and we'll just have a, a general roundtable, virtual roundtable discussion. And hopefully that'll be a good opportunity to explore some of the specific uh, elements of the situation in, the, in which your organisation sits and also some questions that you may have about the uh, planning for disaster resilience within your organisation. So as I mentioned, uh, my name's Steve. I'm the Director of Sport and Community Development with CPR Group. We're a consultancy that are kind of based between the Sunshine Coast and Logan. So we do have several staff, including Michael, who joins us online tonight, um, who are based in the Moreton Bay region. And we've done, for the last 25 years, a lot of uh, community sport and recreation work with uh, organisations and volunteers in the Moreton Bay region. And we've, we've been working with Moreton Bay Council, well, since amalgamation and prior to amalgamation with all three of the um, prior uh, councils. So we've, we've got a good level of familiarity with the, the region. Welcome, Karen. Thanks very much for joining us. So during the session, feel free to ask questions in the little chat field. I'll keep an eye on that as will Michael and uh, we'll deal with any questions that come in during the session at the end. As I mentioned, there'll also be an opportunity for us to have some open dialogue discussion at the end of the session as well. So this disaster resilience program has been designed to support community organisations across the Moreton Bay region to effectively prepare for, respond to and recover from natural disasters. Now, Karen, who's just joined us, will be very familiar with this particular photograph. Uh, and this is uh, actually this might be a photograph from another local club, but this is a great reminder of recent history of just how bad things can get very quickly in the Moreton Bay region. So, you know, here in, in Queensland, we are one of, if not the most disaster affected state in Australia, uh, in Moreton Bay and, you know, the, this Southeast Queensland corner, we've experienced two major floods in just over a decade. And we're, we're hearing that term one in 100 year flood a little less uh, commonly now because it's a bit misleading and us humans think that if we have a one in 100 year flood we're probably going to be okay for another 99 years which as we know uh, firsthand now is 
actually not the case. So we're we're seeing a, a bit of a progression away from that, you know, one in 100 year terminology to an annual exceedance probability or AEP. Now, all that means is if it's if you're in a, a, a flood zone which has a one in 100 year um, uh, prediction of floods or you're at a one in 100 year flood level, that would put you at 1%. So in other words, the likelihood that you're going to flood to that particular level this year is a 1% chance. So that I think sits a little better with us humans who have quite um, uh, emotional thought patterns. And we like to convince ourselves that the the worst possible scenario won't play out. But as we've experienced, as I say, in only the last, you know, 12 years, that's not actually the case. And we need to be better prepared. And we're not, of course, only talking about floods. So we're talking about a host of disasters. And I'll run through a short list in a moment. But this program is all about focusing on what we can do. A lot of Community sport recreation infrastructure is built where we can't build houses and we can't build commercial properties. So we accept that with that community access land comes the very real risk of disaster. And, you know, the reality that we are typically managing community infrastructure on disaster prone land. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to throw up our arms in despair and, you know, walk away from our organisations because, you know, that we're getting flooded year on year or, you know, a few times in a decade to quite a, a, a significant extent. But this slide here uh, demonstrates some, just some simple examples of flood resilience. And, and the photo on the left it demonstrates a building, a new clubhouse building that has been constructed above what we you know, anticipate to be the highest possible flood level. And the image on the right is an indication of flood resilient design. So this is a building that sits on a floodplain that is going to flood. And in recognition of that reality, you can see that the materials that have been used in the construction of that bench and the cabinetry can simply be hosed off following a flood. So we're not talking about chipboard that will swell and be, you know, become completely unusable following a flood. We're talking about stainless steel, aluminium, sheet metal that can simply be hosed out. Yes, the mud might stink. And yes, we might have other problems that we face, such as damaged appliances and, you know, compromised electrical infrastructure. But where we can design our infrastructure to be more resilient, and, and sometimes that's going to mean, you know, trying to do things to prevent the water from finding its way into our property. So sandbagging and the like, or designing our infrastructure in a way that puts us above the anticipated flood levels, but also then construct, designing and constructing our infrastructure in a way that should we, you know, should the worst happen and we experience some natural disaster, at some stage in the future, we're in a position to more quickly recover and get back on our feet so that our operations can resume as promptly as possible. So this program, like I say, is really focused on what we can do. And, and there's only so much that we can do to stop natural disasters happening. Uh, and I'm going to run through in a moment a bit of a reminder on the, the PPRR model of disaster management. And there are some areas that are logical for community organisations to spend more time in their focus. But we're talking about these sorts of disasters. We're not talking about things like a global pandemic, although, of course, we all now have a very fresh memory of what it's like to live through a global pandemic. And I must say that prior to 2000 and late 2019, and really, if I'm being honest, more like early to mid 2020, I didn't think that I'd live through a pandemic. So it's a great reminder that we need to expect the unexpected. Nevertheless, this disaster resilience program is focused on these natural disasters, predominantly speaking. So yes, we know, as I've just said, that we're typically built on, you know, we have infrastructure, community infrastructure that's built on flood prone land because you can't build a lot else on that, in, on that land. But Southeast Queensland, we're also talking about storms, potentially cyclones as well. Most of the Moreton Bay region is identified as bushfire prone or certainly significant areas of the region. So we also need to be conscious that 
we have a lot of community infrastructure which is constructed in close proximity to dense vegetation, dense bushland that can very quickly turn into a raging inferno as we experienced here on the Sunshine Coast not so long ago in Perigian. We are living through a significant period of climate change. Now, what that is expected to result in is major changes in our weather patterns and more severe weather events. So, you know, we we move, you know, between La, uh, La Nina and El Nino weather patterns broadly determined by the temperature of uh, the, the ocean near the eastern uh, seaboard. And what that means is that there's a level of predictability of what the weather might look like in any given year or you know period of several years. We are currently expecting to come out of quite a wet period and into another period of dry times. So we can anticipate that while southeast Queensland probably based on recent experience, won't be as severely affected by drought as some of our north, central northern counterparts elsewhere in the state, we are still likely to experience some effects of that, and some of which may well be notable. But we're also talking about heat waves, potentials for earthquakes. Again, given the nature of our changing weather patterns, there may be more things than are on this list that we don't yet know are going to begin to affect us here in the Moreton Bay region. So the, the program is designed to put community organisations such as all of yours into a better position so that we don't just hit the panic button when we get the, the call comes out that a disaster is imminent, but rather we take a planned and measured and coordinated collaborative approach to managing that risk as it evolves and ideally putting our community organisations into a position where they are most effectively able to respond to the emerging threat, recover post-event, and to then you know, learn from the, the outcomes of any given disaster event so that the next time disaster strikes, we've put into place additional resilience measures, ideally to put us in better stead. So I mentioned this PPRR model, and that stands for Prevention, Preparedness, Response, and Recovery. So this PPRR approach helps to ensure a balance between the reduction of risk and the enhancement of community resilience, while ensuring effective response and recovery capabilities during and following a disaster event. So as I mentioned during our first session late last month, the PPRR model has been the subject of some cr criticism over the last decade or so, with one argument in particular being that the model is too simple. It, it, it's oversimplified and it implies that each phase should be considered in isolation from one another. However, we love the model in the community sector because of its simplicity and its ease of implementation. It's easy to, to wrap your head around the PPRR model. It's therefore easy to conduct your disaster resilience planning in the context of this model, which Michael will talk you all through with the action plan and associated resources shortly. And by working through each phase of the PPRR model, community organisations in the region can reduce the impact the impact of disasters. We, we can't necessarily stop the disasters from happening, but we can reduce the impact of those disasters on your members, your customers, your assets, your infrastructure, and importantly, on your operations and therefore your financial situation. So each of the phases outlines important activities and processes that can help to minimise the impact of disasters and to ensure an effective response. So in the prevention or mitigation phase, and, and mitigation simply is a term that means, you know, we're, we're trying to stop something from happening, or if, if something's going to happen, we try and limit or mitigate the effects of that something going wrong. So in the prevention phase, 
activities and planning aim to prevent or you know minimize the effect of disasters like i said we we can't do very much to prevent a natural disaster from happening but we can put ourselves in a better position should a disaster unfold the preparedness phase is is somewhat tied into that then for us in this context of community organization resilience planning and the preparedness phase involves activities that ensure communities and organizations are prepared to effectively respond to to disasters when they unfold. The response phase then involves the immediate actions that we take in response to a disaster as it unfolds. And the recovery phase involves activities that aim to restore communities and infrastructure as quickly as possible following a disaster. And that takes us back to that photograph that you saw of the the, the flood resilient design. Um, we're also seeing, I, I spoke with a community organization earlier this week who have done some reconstruction activities following flood. And they've, <clears throat> pardon me, done what they can to remove cavities in their internal walls. So, you know, when it comes to flood, as any of you who've lived through a flood will know, anywhere that mud and silt can store and be trapped, poses a terrible risk of rot and you know further ongoing health and um, uh, property damage risks so to to do away with internal cavities and and construct using you know brick for instance or some other material that does away with cavities wherever we can helps to limit the the risk that mud and silt will find its way into hard to reach areas so like i say we along with council, have taken an approach through this disaster resilience support program to make, we know, we've been working with volunteers for 25 years. So we know that typically speaking, community organisations don't have an abundance of people sticking their hand up to help out. So the last thing that council wants to do through this program is make your lives as community organisation volunteers any more difficult. So Michael's about to talk you through the resources that we and council have prepared through this program, and that includes an action plan itself, a template that guides you through the process of constructing a tailored disaster resilience action plan for your organisation. And it prompts you to think about all different sorts of disasters, focusing on the key ones at which we're at most risk, and it guides you through this four-phase PPRR model process, and most of the plan is pre-populated. Michael has pulled together a, a, a sample which demonstrates the work that you need to do in completing your plan. And of course, as every organization is unique, there's an opportunity for you to create additional uh, content in that template so that the, the, the document itself very clearly uh, covers what you need to be considering to become better prepared and to put you in and your organization in a position where you can very promptly and efficiently respond and, and then uh, recover following a, a disaster event. So I am now going to stop my screen sharing. I'm going to enable Michael to share his screen, which you should be able to do now. And Michael's going to talk you through the, the templates that we've developed and demonstrate just how easy it is for your organization to create a tailored disaster resilience action plan, along with all of the supporting resources to enable um, uh, your organization to be in the best possible position to, to prepare for and to recover, respond to and recover from natural disasters. Just as a quick reminder that given that this session is being recorded, um, you will be able to share this content with others in your organisation. In, in just a word on what I said earlier about our recognition of the fact that volunteer volunteering is a dying, tra dying, dying trade, so to speak. Um, it's important that those of you who are joining us tonight don't feel as though you've got to leave tonight's session and carry the burden of this planning process all on your own. We would far rather see this be a collaborative process between a number of your organization's uh, volunteers 
And of course, it goes without saying that that's the, the stands the greatest chance of putting your organization in a, a well prepared position. Because if so, when something goes wrong, I'm going to say when, because it's inevitable that disaster will strike again. It's imperative that it's not just one person who understands this plan and its associated set of resources. All right, I will mute myself, Fish, so that I cannot talk while you are talking. Yeah, it'll have to be a powerful mute button. Um, can you uh, see my screen okay, everyone? Yep, excellent. Uh, so as Steve said, uh, it was a really interesting process pulling together these resources. When I first heard the terms disaster resilience plan and supporting resources, uh, I thought of volunteers and I thought that could be um, a real headache or, or worry because it, it sounds like a really lengthy process or document so what we really tried to do was find uh, the key things that your organizations need to be aware of and simplify them as much as as possible in a really practical way so there's a, a heap of resources out there um, there's some which are specifically tailored to community organizations some which are specifically tailored to businesses um, we tried to pick the, the most practical and uh, relevant and uh, easily implementable ones. So the master document is the Disaster Resilience Action Plan. So this essentially is the, the, the port that feeds out uh, into all the other resources that you have and it's where you record things like who's responsible for what, um, when things need to get done and you can come back to it uh, at, at any point in time um, and keep it as a living, breathing document because uh, we know with these types of documents that uh, they, if they're not uh, relevant, they'll quickly um, sit on a shelf or in, a, in the background of a computer and, and never see the life of day again. So uh, it's something which I guess can be updated in a, in a live sense. So Steve's talked through a lot about the purpose of disaster resilience planning, but there is a, a section in, in the action plan as well. So anyone who opens up this document can readily see why it's being prepared and importantly, see the benefits of disaster resilience planning. Uh, so these are some of the, the recognized benefits from the research, obviously at extreme levels, protecting people's lives, um, reducing damage caused by disasters, very relevant to our organizations, our local community organizations. Uh, in an intangible way, it can help build community cohesion um, by strengthening relationships between community members as you look out for each other in these types of situations. Uh, there's opportunities to promote sustainable practices through things like the, the flood resilient uh, design that Steve was talking about, I'd imagine would fit within that category. And uh, reducing costs, obviously very important as well um, for, for local uh, community run organisations. So there's a section where you can complete your own objectives or there's an example set of objectives for you, which align pretty well with the plan as we've written it. Uh, it, it is important, I think, for your committees to, to give some thought to these objectives and whether you want to tailor them um, specifically for you or if there's anything you want to add, uh, yeah, or, or amend. Um, Ultimately, the way we've prepared these plans is so that you can adapt them as you need to. We've done them in Microsoft Word so that uh, any um, parts that you need to, to adjust, you can do that. Uh, and sometimes with these templates, it can be really easy to just hand out a template which everyone just adopts. Um, the thing that we've tried to do is find a balance between that, knowing that we want to save your um, valuable time as well as giving you uh, the understanding of what disaster resilience actually is. So by doing the process, you'll practically know what needs to be done um, rather than just having something which has been um, pre-prepared and no one really understands. So again, uh, for anyone who opens this plan, there is a one page overview of the PPR uh, framework. Uh, which just familiarizes them with that. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that's the actual framework that we've used for the plan. So each section falls under one of those headings. Uh, the disaster types, uh, we've primarily focused on natural disasters, as Steve said earlier in the workshop. 
Although it's important to note that there are sections within the plan uh, where you can add other things. So you can add um, specific actions for pandemics or IT threats or anything else, which is going to interrupt your day-to-day -day operations um, because you probably will see a lot of crossover there. Um, if you think about it, uh, shutting down for a flood, um, shutting down for a, a health emergency, shutting down your operations because of an IT threat, um, all interrupting day-to-day -day operations. So we wanted to capitalise on any crossover there so that you can record those things in the process as well. Um, whilst noting that uh, we are primarily focused on uh, the Moreton Bay region, South East Queensland, how can we help you get ready for natural disasters? Uh, so we've pre-populated all of the natural disaster stuff and then the other disaster is um, is blank, although I'll show you some examples of those uh, tonight as we go through it. So there's a section for a disaster resilience team whilst recognising that this could be uh, people with uh, multiple hats and probably will be. Uh, but the important thing about this is knowing who are uh, the contact people in the events of disaster, both um, prior, during and, and post. So roles might be things like your committee members, your president, secretary, treasurer. Uh, what we've also done is we've prepared a series of role descriptions, um, most of which are about one page, um, just to help uh, consolidate those and and get what it is that actually needs to be done for each person. Um, now, as I say, that could be someone who already takes on uh, a role in your organisation or it could be someone completely different. So if you've got a member who you know works in this type of area um, or if you've got a member who comes to you with some spare time, uh, this is a, a potential opportunity to get them involved with uh, a different role. Uh, so the way we've done it is we've written it up as if it was a working group and we've included what that working group would need to do. So the number of times it would need to, to meet, um, what responsibilities it would have, um, all the types of things that you would have for a normal committee. Um, whilst noting that not everyone will want to take this on, um, a lot of people will just decide to do it using the, their current um, structures. Um, we wanted to give you the opportunity to, to um, share the workload. So the roles that I was talking about, um, we've provided five templates um, for them. One being a chair of that working group I mentioned, uh, a communications lead, an evacuations lead, a volunteers lead and a recovery lead. So each of those roles, um, you can see we've outlined what they need to do during each of the phase of disaster resilience and also some of the skills and experience that they might uh, need to possess or um, receive training for. So moving on to the next part of the action plan, uh, we've got all your external contacts. So some are pre-populated because they're the, the same for all organisations. And then there's some to be filled out uh, for different parts of your organisation, such as your security companies and insurance companies and so on. And then we move to the actual action plan. So the first section being prevent and prepare. Um, I've done an example uh, for this table. Uh, so it's called general preparation for natural disasters. And uh, there's some really simple actions to take which apply across all natural disasters. Um, the first one being to sign up to Morton Alert. And uh, we would really encourage uh, everyone within your organisations who are um, based in the Morton area to, to do that, um, especially your management committee members and uh, any volunteers uh, who are involved with your organisation. Uh, it's a fantastic resource and, and one as well, which has been pointed out to me, uh, can complement other ones. So for example, if you work in the city in Brisbane, um, you might uh, have signed up to Brisbane's Natural Disaster Alert, but you live in Morton, so you can sign up for that one as well and know what's going on locally. And that just saves having to um, always be across uh, the news and the websites and, and so on. So the evacuation plan, uh, that is as per uh, what's provided by Queensland Fire Emergency Services. 
So I'll show you briefly what that looks like now. Uh, we've pulled the one for low occupancy buildings being the one which would be uh, most commonly relevant uh, to your organisations. So it's about a, about a four page document. Um, there are some technical terms in here. I imagine a lot of organisations could already have this in place. Some basic details at the start, um, some of your evacuation procedures, uh, some details on your firefighting equipment, uh, your, your instructions for foreign evacuation. Uh, and towards the end, uh, there is a um, space for evacuation signs and uh, diagrams uh, to which templates are also provided by Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. So I was talking to Steve earlier and if anyone um, is looking for help with pulling this together, uh, being a bit of a technical document, we're happy for you to come to us in the first instance um, and we can uh, guide you through that process. Okay, so as you can see with the table, there isn't actually a whole lot to complete. Really what's required is to give some thought to who is going to be responsible and when do things need to be done by. So with this table that I've, I've prepared as an example earlier, a lot of them are the first things that you need to do, like signing up to Morton Alert. So I've put a time frame of one month uh, or May 2023. And of the types of people responsible, I've used some of the examples from the working group. Um, that's not to say that uh, it couldn't be your existing committee members. So your communications person might uh, be a, a secretary of an organisation. Um, your evacuations lead, you may um, end up putting the president uh, or one of your committee members. Um, there's some things that relate to, to groundskeeping. So uh, you can input any people or roles here that um, you best see fit works for your organisation. I'll just quickly jump in there if I can, um, Fish, to point out mm. to everyone that so um, Michael's filled this, uh, completed this plan as an example of what a, a completed plan might look like pending um, finalisation of some of those actions. So you see the date completed column there remains um, uh, blank. But it's important to note just for anyone who hasn't yet opened up the Disaster Resilience Action Plan template, so the blank document for want of a better term, but when you do that, you'll you'll see that the action column that is completed there on your screen is already pre-populated. So Fish hasn't added any of those items into the action column. He has only completed the persons responsible in the time frame column in this particular table. So that's a demonstration of, of, of really how little work there is to do to tailor the template to your organisation in the first instance. As Fish will point out, there are some blank template, uh, sorry, there are some blank sections in the document, um, but I promised that I would mute and now I've gone and unmuted. So I'm going to go and mute myself again for you, Fish. That was important. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so moving to the next section, uh, there's some basic checklists uh, which are important for all disasters and again we've prepared them as appendices uh, so things like emergency kit preparation alternatives for loss of power backing up data um, your insurance and policies and so on so there's a, a couple of pages in total um, the first one yeah the emergency kit uh, so it's really just a matter of allocating someone to go through and complete these checklists and that'll uh, cover off on those preparation items. Um, there's also one here for on the day of a disaster. So you can refer back to the checklist then and the other um, types of checklists that I mentioned. So it could be one person who does all these checklists or you could um, divide it up um, between a couple of people and it, it never hurts to have a couple of sets of eyes looking over these types of things. So next part, uh, we start to move into the specific disaster types and how you can prepare for those. Uh, so storms, floods and cyclones, um, a fantastic resource that Moreton Bay Regional Council has is a flood check property report. Uh, so that links uh, directly to that website and you can input the address of 
uh, your your property or your organization's property. And that'll, uh, I did it for my house uh, living in Strathpine. Uh, and yep, I'm all good for now, although prone to flash flooding. Um, and uh, yeah, it came up in a couple of seconds. So uh, really, really simple action to do that one. And then it just talks you through some of the other um, storm, flood and cyclone preparation that you can go through. Uh, there's a list of sandbag locations uh, linked here, which is always handy to know um, prior, to the, prior to the event as a bit of your, your planning um, and to come back to when you need it. Chris, just to clarify for everyone, um, mm. clicking on those links will open those pages automatically for them. Yes. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, could you just show how easy it would be to add extra lines into those tables? Just so yes. if someone wanted to fill it out and they weren't quite sure how to add some extra lines in, yep. okay, we'll go about doing that, please. Thank you. Yes, sure. So uh, the best way would just be to add a new row into the Microsoft table. Um, so sorry, I've, I've gone a little bit quick there, but right click, insert rows below or rows above. So in this case, I'll go below. And then you can um, type your new action. So um, in this case, we might say, uh, let's buy gloves and protective equipment or something like that. Does that uh, cover what you were asking, Lee? Yes, thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, the other way you could do it is to, if you wanted to keep it as part of the same action, you could just um, hit your return or enter button and then just type underneath. Okay, so the next type of disaster, um, probably in one of the alternate years that Steve was talking about, uh, bushfire and fire preparation. So, uh, we, again, we've got um, a pretty uh, succinct linked of actions here. There's about 10 in total. Um, one thing which we wanted to bring to attention in particular was uh, there is a, a postcode checker for Queensland provided by um, the Queensland Fire Services. Uh, so we do need to do a quick update to this plan uh, to link to that, but uh, that'll come in the coming days. If you um, want to check it out before then, you could just uh, search bushfire postcode checker in Google, uh, or I'll bring across the web page now, so you may be able to just. I've see added it. that in um, once once you've finished your run through fish. I'll put up a um, a slide with a list of links, and this one is one of them. So um, awesome. People will be able to, oh, and Linda's just popped it in. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is what the web page looks like. Uh, really simple. Uh, they've got a color code, um, dark pink indicating uh, areas uh, that could be at risk of a dangerous fire, and light pink um, should be aware that they are close to areas that could be at risk of a dangerous fire. Uh, so I, um, I searched earlier for a property in Ningi at uh, Sandstone Point Way, and uh, it turned out that it, it was in one of the, the high risk areas. Um, so we could have a quick look at somewhere at Sanford Way. Look at that, Sanford District Bowls Club. Um, so a bit of an interactive map. Um, there's a plus and minus button up here to zoom in and zoom out. Um, and it'll bring you with a dot on the map and you can see under the color code there, it's in the light pink area, but also quite close to uh, one of the, the dark pink areas. So one of those areas that's at risk um, being close to an area of, of a dangerous fire. Uh, right throughout the document, there are uh, other links uh, which you can click that uh, text in blue and underline. So for example, here we there's a guide on how to clear vegetation uh, for fire management. So that'll click you through to that web link. And then uh, 
moving on to some non uh, perhaps urgent emergency related disasters, if that's the correct way of, of putting it, um, drought preparation and heat wave preparation, uh, still relevant, uh, not as much action here, but uh, something to be prepared for. Uh, so there's a, a few things there like identifying your, your water sources, um, keeping across rainfall records as relevant for, for droughts. Um, when it comes to heat waves, uh, the main point uh, tends to be relating to communication and communicating how to avoid heat stress. So there's some, some links there on where to go for that. And also, if there's a hot weather the policy applying for participation, um, particularly in, in sport, uh, there's often governing body resources available for that. Uh, if not, there are a number of um, places or examples or, or feel free to come to us and we can help find you an example. So this is the section we were talking about, which is just left blank uh, for you to fill in with any other uh, actions that you want to um, relating to be it, uh, other disasters or uh, something else um, not covered in the, in the natural disasters prior, previously mentioned. So I've prepared an example here uh, related to disease outbreaks. So an action area could just be to regularly check current disease information. And that could be assigned to a communications person or perhaps a secretary. And that might be done uh, prior, uh, as uh, news comes to hand or um, prior to meetings to prepare for these types of things. So we now move into the uh, response part of the plan. What we've done is to help uh, in the, I guess, the pressure cooker situation that can sometimes arise uh, when this happens. And, you know, perhaps you're, you're well prepared, um, but uh, we all know that um, humans behave differently under, under pressure. And uh, it just helps to have those extra little prompts, extra guides, extra support resources. So we've broken those up into the different, the main types of disasters, and they're located in Appendix 5. So I'll show you what that looks like. So bushfire response, um, just talking you through the basic steps, uh, always calling triple zero and life-threatening emergencies comes before each and every one of these. Um, monitoring the, the appropriate warnings with links going through to those pages. Uh, talking about the initial response. So uh, doing things like unplugging electrical equipment and sh shutting down the master electrical board and, and gas supply, um, remembering to collect your emergency kit. It could be, a, um, you know, in the, uh, the, the dash that could be, um, that might be something that gets forgotten. So it's just a reminder to do that um, and those types of things. Uh, one that's coming up, Pretty commonly, fair to say, in recent years is the flood response. Uh, so again, in addition to the point around unplugging electrical equipment and shutting down the master elect electrical, one of the key considerations there is securing vehicles, equipment and supplies. Um, so that might be getting things high up or doing uh, as, as best you can to secure all those um, before uh, the, the flood hits. Uh, noting that some of the organisations themselves are evacuation centres, uh, there's a point here around just following council direction there. That's, uh, we haven't gone into too much more detail, but that would be something uh, I, I'm sure our council would communicate with the, the organisations as relevant. So section again for your um, other disaster response actions this time have been the next part of the PPR uh, framework. And we then move to the recovery stage. So this is broken down into the different timeframes of recovery. So firstly, hours and days after the incident, we've highlighted in the plans, or we're going to highlight in some updated versions, the importance of looking after yourself and others and returning to the premises only when safe. Uh, that's a priority number one goes goes without saying we know but uh by that same token 
when you, you're so passionate about something as a uh, organization that you're involved in, um, yeah, it, it might come as second nature to do whatever you can to protect it, but it's just a reminder for everyone involved, all your members, um, all your volunteers uh, to uh, protect themselves and, and each other and stay safe first. So one of the first things that will happen after a disaster is uh, assessment on what's happened, um, what the impact was. So that'll be things like returning to the premises and um, securing dangerous debris. Uh, there's a bit of work there potentially in getting volunteers rounded up. Uh, so that's the type of thing that you could look to have a volunteers lead involved if you choose to go that route with identifying someone for that role. Assessing damage, um, recording decisions and photos and videos of damage, uh, and there's an event log which you can use linked here for your insurance claims. Um, there's some more guidance on clearing vegetation this time after a natural disaster um, and some disaster cleanup tips. Um, no doubt there'd be plenty there again around um, doing that, that safely and how to follow that safety safely. And uh, as part of all this process, unfortunately, there'll be some estimations of repair, replacement and relocation costs. Uh, then it goes into contacting insurers and banks. So there's a number of resources here uh, which are designed uh, to support you in doing just that. Um, one of the resources that I really like is contained in this uh, Appendix 3 communications plan. Um, so it's actually got some tips on what to say uh, or how to message with your insurers and banks and utility providers. Um, so that's here in Appendix 3. Um, some tips around uh, yeah, contacting your bank and asking for help um, and uh, the types of what to do and the types of hardship that can come up in these situations. So something which we all hope never happens, but we know that we'll need support if it does. Um, while I'm here in this Appendix 3, uh, it's also got uh, some space for how to communicate with your different stakeholders. So I've uh, done this as an example and just listed some communication methods. Uh, so for example, volunteers and staff, uh, it may be necessary to communicate with them via phone and email. Uh, Depending on the situation, you may need to get an acknowledgement of the, of the message. Customers and guests, social media can be quite useful there in addition to the other um, mediums I've already mentioned uh, and, and so on. So that, that goes into this concept of communication cascades. So it's a fairly straightforward concept. Really the idea is uh, just that, to have the cascade uh, ensure that everyone is contacted at the right levels of the organisation. And uh, by doing this prior, you can uh, not have to, uh, have to wing it, so to speak, and uh, know that you've covered all your, all your bases. So an example that we've provided is you might have a, a chair of that working group, or in your case, it might be the president of your organisation who receives the weather alert update uh, and then advises the working group or the rest of the committee. Uh, the, the person um, responsible for leading volunteers might advise all your members and request some assistance. Uh, the person responsible for evacuations might contact um, coaches or managers or um, other volunteers within your organisation to let them know. And then a communications person or a secretary might post on social media to let the broader um, public and, and membership know. And there's even some suggested messaging in here, uh, which you can uh, take or ad adapt as you needed. Um, this is from the uh, Small Business Queensland website. Um, the reason why we pulled it from Small Business Queensland is it was the most practical resource we could find available. And a lot of the other resources didn't have this kind of uh, template wording uh, that, that you could readily just pick up uh, and apply. So that's, that's all there. Uh, it's all written. So uh, once you've done your plan, you can just come back to it later when you need it. Okay, so we're coming to the, the end of the uh, disaster process and 
hopefully everyone's uh, made a, a strong recovery. So we worked through early recovery days and weeks after the incident. Uh, there's, it's important to know that it, it doesn't just stop um, straight away. There, there's more to do. Uh, so there might be things like uh, providing support services for volunteers and, and staff. Um, there's, there's a lot of free counselling services available and, and there's links there to that. Um, in some extreme cases, uh, there's uh, closing down and, and reopening. Uh, there's some more information here about financial recovery, uh, recovering your IT and data records, um, appreciating that some of this uh, might be starting to get a little overwhelming at this point, um, but it's better to have it listed and uh, be thinking about it than, than not, I would say. And then again, uh, there is a, a long-term recovery, so months and years after the, the incident. And this um, would be where you'd start to consider any lessons learned and uh, potentially do a formal review of the disaster process that you went through. Um, so again, we've, we've provided a, a template that you can use for that, that's Appendix 7. And there's an example contained within that. So it follows the same framework, preparation, um, response and recovery. Prevent, uh, with that general preparation in, includes uh, prevention. So we, we might just make a note to more clearly specify that. But uh, we've also included disaster specific preparation. So you can talk here about how you responded uh, in this instance um, and any learnings from that. And then it would probably be uh, wise after each uh, disaster to go through uh, with these lessons and make any updates that you need to to the actual action plan itself. And hopefully that wouldn't take too long because you'd already have the action plan there. Um, you'd just be adding or amending um, what's already in place. So in terms of monitoring and review, in addition to after disasters doing a review, uh, it would be recommended to review the plan itself at least annually. And that would just be to check that everything is, is up to date, check your contacts are up to date, check um, your actions and, and people uh, and anything else is up to date. Um, no doubt uh, there'll be new resources which become available as well. So it's a good opportunity to to just keep refreshed on everything. So like I said, there is a lot of information out there um, and even a lot of information that I've just covered uh, tonight, uh, but it's designed in a way to uh, help you work through it methodically and uh, in a way where everything is um, provided there ready for you. So um, outside of that, uh, there's some supporting resources at the end of the document. Uh, we predominantly use the small business um, resources, as I said, uh, mostly because that had the most practical um, guidelines and uh, checklists and, and tips. Uh, but uh, there's, yeah, there's a wealth of information. Um, what One thing I didn't touch on, which I wanted to, was uh, there's a um, disaster dashboard from uh, Moreton Bay Regional Council. So really um, valuable for your organizations in terms of local information. So I'll show you that now. So um, feel free to jump in if you like, Linda or Lee, but the way I saw this was, it's almost a one-stop shop for your um, disaster information. Um, so no emergencies at the moment, but uh, that would come up there. Uh, they're looking at some of the, the tabs that do have information. It's even got your, your road conditions and, and closures. Um, your current weather warnings. So I believe all this is sourced from the Bureau of Meteorology. So instead of having to go through and check every um, different site, um, it's here as a, here as a dashboard. Uh, and there's also a interactive map. So you can view things like your, your sandbag locations by clicking that here, um, your evacuation centers, um, your, your flood and overland flow areas. Uh, so 
yeah, and then you scroll down even to the fire danger rating, the weather observations and weather warnings. So I think in terms of alerts, if you've signed up to Morton Alert and you're logging into the disaster dashboard, uh, it's one you're going to have all have majority, if not all, of the information you need. And it's, it's probably going to save you a lot of time having to um, jump around a bunch of different websites. Uh, so the link to that is also contained uh, within the action plan. And that would be something which I think your um, disaster resilience team would uh, make sure they're well across. It'd be a good thing to bookmark in your um, web browsers and and the like. Uh, so yeah, I apologize. That took a little bit longer than I thought. Uh, getting through one action plan and seven appendices um, was never gonna be a quick task. I was probably too ambitious, uh, but uh, I hope that helps everyone and that this is a, a useful resource in uh, each of your organizations. Awesome. Thank you, Fish. Linda, do you wanna jump in and add anything in particular before I carry on with a few more points. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Michael. I think um, I was making some notes as we're going along, but the two major things that I would definitely stress, and I know this is about filling out the action plan today, and I note that in the template there are lots of hyperlinks um, to mm. great information everywhere. But if there are the two things that um, are from a disaster management perspective that I would recommend um, that yourselves your committee members, even your members, if you wanted to put out a, um, you know, a, um, a social media drive for your members, for everyone to be signed up to Morton Alert. So that is a free messaging system. So it doesn't cost anybody anything. Um, and your information that you do provide to us, um, and apologies if you already know this, um, we, don't, we don't pass off to anybody else. We don't sell your information. So you won't get any weird overseas phone calls. Um, but uh, super important because what we do, uh, we have staff within our team on call 24-7, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So as soon as we get warning messages from Queensland Fire and Emergency Services, for example, or the Bureau of Meteorology, you will then be receiving those messages instantly. So um, well, almost instantly, the time that it takes us to open up the laptop and then forward on those messages to you. So Morton Alert's a big one, but also that disaster dashboard. So that disaster dashboard, we do link into all of those um, other agencies like the Bureau of Meteorology, social media posts, et cetera. So that can be that one-stop shop for yourselves and your organisation during and immediately post a disaster event because we will be pumping information through to there. Um, just be um, I just mindful when Michael showed you how you could turn on locations for evacuation centres, for example, or sandbagging locations, you'll need to just hover over the icon that um, that you're interested in because not all of our evacuation centres, for example, may be open. So we certainly don't want you then going to potentially an evacuation centre that's closed. But we will have marked on there what is open and what is closed. You'll be able to clearly see that. That's probably all for me for the moment. Thanks, Steve. Brilliant. Thank you, Linda. Um, and yeah, just to reiterate what Linda's just said, there is a team of uh, people within... Morton Bay Regional Council who are there to support you and your community organisations during and immediately following a disaster, make use of that resource. I, I can't stress enough, you know, Michael and myself and the rest of our team in our work with volunteer-led organisations day in, day out are encouraging volunteers to make use of the resources that are available to them. So whether it's Linda and the disaster management team, whether it's Lee and um, others in the sport and recreation team, tap into those resources. And those of you amongst us tonight or who are watching this uh, recording and have a good working partnership with council personnel will certainly attest to the reality that their, their help is forthcoming readily and they're really keen to to provide it so hopefully you'll be able to see my screen again now and i'm going to just in the first instance share with you the the two links from where you can access the recording of the first session as well as where the recording of tonight's session will ultimately be made available also 
uh, all of the resources that Michael has just talked us through. So the Disaster Resilience Action Plan template itself, as well as all of the appendices. There's also some posters that you can print off and put up uh, around your organization's premises, as well as some flashcards that provide prompts for the key steps in the PPRR process. So both from Moreton Bay Regional Council's website, as well as from CPR Group's website, you'll be able to access all of those resources. There's also then this slide, which just has a handful of useful links. So again, to reiterate the Morton Alert and Disaster Dashboard links that both Michael and Linda have mentioned there. Also the flood check link, and finally the bushfire postcode checker. So there is, as, as Linda's pointed out, and as, as Michael's talked us through an abundance of links within the action plan template. So as Michael started during his uh, spiel, there's a whole lot of information out there and it can be overwhelming and you can go down a rabbit hole and, you know, find yourself completing one resource or template only to find that there's something more usable or more suited to your organization that you stumble across subsequently. So the idea of pulling all of this together into the one easily accessible central repository is to save you from having to do all of that groundwork. And the same applies absolutely as Michael just demonstrated for the disaster dashboard. And even better, Morton Alert will push notifications to you. And I can attest to how effective the Morton Alert system is because I remember running a couple of sessions at a flash forum, which was the first flash forum put on by council for community sport and recreation organizations post the, the main or first lockdown of uh, related to COVID in 2020. And all these bings and dings and vibrations started to go off around the room and it, it was a notification that Morton Bay region was going to go into a snap lockdown for a few days came through and you know we were going into lockdown the next day so it was lucky that the forum was scheduled for that particular day so it was fascinating to see that firsthand and it was easy to spot all the people who were uh, signed up to Morton Alert and if it wasn't for the fact that all of those people were in the one room with others who were not on Morton Alert, the notifications would have come through sometime later. And I think that the COVID pandemic and our need for very prompt responses uh, during the lockdowns and in, in the lead up to lockdowns highlights the importance of having these tools that notify us when things are going wrong, because I, I'm, I'm woefully out of touch when it comes to social media. And of course, Social media has become, you know, even more prolific in its matter of getting information distributed very quickly. So people who are, you know, on social media in the office here will all get some notification. And it's lucky that I'm here in the office with them because otherwise I wouldn't get it as well. So save yourself having to lose hours and hours to social media and just sign up to Morton Alert instead. So I now want to give you a really quick, well, Michael, actually, our managing director is going to give you a, a really quick demonstration of Asset Track. Now, Asset Track is an asset register. It's, it's an online tool and it is an asset register, but it is also a preventative maintenance tool. So the idea is that you load all of your organization's assets into the system. That's not a particularly enjoyable task, but the good news is you only need to do it once. Once your asset register is constructed and you've uh, built a list of inspectors, as we call them, they are the people to whom responsibility for conducting maintenance activities on your assets is assigned. And once you've got your inspectors, you've got your asset register set up, you will then, those inspectors, be pushed notifications again in the context of the discussion we've just been having about Morton Alert when maintenance activities fall due. So there are 20 high-risk organizations that have been identified through this process as being particularly prone to natural disasters within the Moreton Bay region. Those organizations are joining us, or a selection of representatives of those organizations are joining us online this evening. Your organizations will receive two years of access to Asset Track through this program. And all you've got to do is work with us to give us the best email address to set up the account under. And we will work collaboratively with you. And as Michael mentioned earlier, come to us in the first instance with any questions about the resources and templates and also come to us 
and we will work with you to get you set up in the asset track system. And we'll also assist you to get your initial assets uploaded so that we can demonstrate with you firsthand how that process looks. You'll also get a, a quick rundown from Michael in this short video that I'll show you in a moment. So your organizations will receive two years of free access to asset track. The, the, should you choose to continue the subscription after that date, it's about 250 bucks or 270 bucks a year. So it, it is very affordable as a means to minimize your um, exposure to risk should you lose everything. And uh, as you'll also hear from some of the organizations that we're interviewing through this disaster resilience program, remembering all the stuff that you own when you lose it all is very difficult. So without a, a good asset register that is accurate and up to date, the process of making claims on insurance or applying for grants to recover equipment that you've lost can be very difficult, if not impossible. So to, to other organizations, though, that are watching this recording, your organization can go to assettrack.com.au and simply sign up for a subscription for this tool. And again, we are available. Should anyone have any questions, feel free to get in touch with us directly. So I'll show you this video now, which runs for a little over two and a half minutes, and it will provide an introduction to the asset track system for you to introduce you to the concept and how to set an account up. And that's quite a funny face that Michael's pulling yeah, in that image. Is he okay? Yeah. <laughs> so I will uh, hit play on this now. Hopefully you'll be able to see and hear it clearly. And like I say, don't, don't be concerned that this video moves quite quickly because the recording will be available and you can come back to it. But even easier than that, you can pick up the phone or we'll schedule a time for a one-on-one -on -one online session with you to talk you through the process. Asset Track is an intuitive, full lifecycle asset register and asset management platform. It makes adding assets simple and it automates the process of allocating and managing asset maintenance jobs. You can log in and get started straight away. The first thing you should do is to set up inspectors. These are the people in the club with whom you'll share the load of inspecting and maintaining the club's assets. Then you can build your asset register. It's easy, intuitive and quick to add assets. Firstly, select the asset category and subcategory from the drop-down menus. If you're wondering where something fits, simply look it up in the asset category list. Then add a description of the asset and its current location, which could be a street address for things like fields or buildings, or a person for small assets like the club's phones and computers. There are fields for you to add the details of each asset, like its manufacturer, model and serial numbers, purchase price and purchase date. To complete adding the asset, include its estimated replacement date and how much you think it will cost to replace it when you need to. From there, you can assign the asset to an inspector, add details of its maintenance, and then when you select a maintenance category, Asset Track will pre-populate suggested maintenance activities for you automatically. You can then select the maintenance frequency, due date and expected maintenance costs, upload some photos of the asset and hit save. Asset Track will then let the inspector know via email that they've been assigned the asset and remind them to perform the maintenance activities by the due date. When the inspector completes their assigned maintenance, it's really easy and quick for them to complete a maintenance report. They can log in from their phone, make a note of the maintenance activities that were completed, add some photos and tick to confirm that the asset is either still fit for purpose or suggest to the club that it's time for the asset to be replaced. If you're on a tenure agreement with council that requires you to maintain some assets, Asset Track makes it easy for you to keep up with your maintenance obligations and to make sure that those little assets don't keep walking out the door. The Asset Track dashboard gives you a quick snapshot of your upcoming maintenance costs to help you budget, as well as showing you how much you've recently spent on maintenance activities. You can also filter the dashboard to show you things like the total value of all of your assets and, maybe more importantly, how much you should be saving up in a sinking fund to replace your assets. For more on using Asset Track, you can check out the help section. I can tell you firsthand that Asset Track works. And I can tell you that because I'm terrible at getting my vehicle serviced 
when it falls due. I always get to the mileage before I get to the 12 months. So when Kirsty, our business facilitator, got frustrated with uh, my lack of proactivity when it comes to getting my car serviced, she loaded the car into Asset Track, into our own subscription. And now, well before the 12 month period, more like eight or nine months, when she knows that my car is going to be ready for a service, Asset Track sends me an email and it says, Steve, your vehicle is coming up for due to service. And I know when I get that first email that if I don't do something about it and book the car in and complete the maintenance inspection in the system, I'm going to keep getting emails. So it actually drives my behavior, pun intended, to book my car in to get a service. So in in the realm of community organizations led by volunteers, there's a lot of maintenance activities that fall off the bottom. Asset track is designed to stop anything from falling off the bottom. So as I mentioned, those organizations identified as being at the highest risk of natural disaster will receive two years of subscription to Asset Track at no cost. So at the end of the session tonight, there'll be an opportunity for us to discuss when uh, when might suit to set up a, a, a chat one-on-one with your organization and uh, to talk about that process of getting you set up in the system. One thing that I just wanted to come back to um, uh, briefly, when it comes to listing your contact information, your organization's contact information with council, try to avoid just having one person as the contact or avoid having just one organizational email address or phone number listed with council as the contact person within your organization. Rather, get as many of your uh, readily accessible uh, organizational contacts listed on council's database so that should council, whether it be the disaster management team, or whether it be the sport and recreation team, for instance, needs to get in contact with your organization, they're able to do so. And similar to the communication cascade that Michael mentioned earlier, council will be able to contact one after the other, the people in your team until they reach someone. Should you have any questions about anything that we've discussed this evening, either email sportrecreation at mortonbay.qld.gov.au or contact your regular contact at council. Or as Michael and I have been saying, just reach out to CPR Group, whether it's info at cprgroup.com.au or you give us a call on our direct phone number, which you'll find on our website. Just pick up the phone, just shoot us an email. We are here and very, very happy to help. As we've covered ad nauseum, we don't want to add any extra burden to your organizations. The idea of this program is to equip you with the tools to as simply and efficiently as possible develop a tailored disaster resilience action plan for your organization. And any questions at all, just get in contact with us. Those organizations that make use of that resource being our support as well as councils are those that are gonna end up with the most comprehensive and easy to follow plans to guide you through the tough times that inevitably will come again. So before I throw open the discussion and and stop sharing my screen, uh, for anyone who has any questions, we'll talk through those and we can maybe even look to set some some dates for one-on-one sessions for anyone who's online and would like to do so. That the here are the next steps for us collaboratively. So a range of time that suits from your end and ours Uh, to set up a Zoom meeting just like this. And we will work directly with you through any questions that you've got in completing your resource and also in getting you set up in Asset Track and getting some of your assets uploaded into the system, assigning inspectors so that you become familiar with that process to get you over that initial barrier of using it for the first time. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, which means that all of our little heads are going to pop up. And If you have a question, I am very, very happy for you to throw it into the mix now. There are no questions that have come in in the chat window. Linda kindly shared a link to the postcode checker on the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services website, Um, but no other questions have come in. Does anyone have a question relating to anything that we've discussed tonight, anything that we covered in the first session on the 29th of March or... 
anything that you feel we haven't yet covered that you want to discuss? Or has everyone got lots and lots of information? <laughs> Greg, I can see you've unmuted. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, you mentioned that the, the plan is in a Word format, but the link that is in our email, it goes straight to PDF. So I don't know if we can get our Word document sent out, emailed out. It definitely, yes. Yeah, so yeah. the the file that Michael was scrolling through earlier, uh, that Word document is available at both of those links. So on Council's okay. website and also on ours. As Michael mentioned, we've got a couple of tweaks to do in there, adding a couple of links. Um, so so we'll do that and they'll be available from those pages tomorrow. So the, 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 the place where you'll get access first is our website. So I'm just going to put that link in the chat so you can click on that straight away. And, and we're able to immediately get the stuff uploaded tomorrow. And that link there in the chat is where you'll find stuff available immediately. Doesn't look like it's come up as a live link. So you might need to just copy that text and paste it into your web yep. browser. But the content, the, the up-to-date Microsoft Word Disaster Resilience Action Plan template will be available there tomorrow. And then in the following days or week or so, it'll become available on the council website as well. No, it just takes a little longer to get that page updated. That's all. Yep. But and you good. said that asset track management system is good for tracking, not just your actual assets, but um, ongoing um, items that you need to address throughout the year. So we could use it for other things as well, but yeah. Yeah. And it's a I'll tool. More later. Yeah. It's a tool that has been used really broadly. So we've got uh, even some private schools that are tracking their, <clears throat> pardon me, IT gear with it. Uh, it's been used as a key register by some organizations. So yeah. we've, it's, it's purpose built. So it's purpose built for organizations like yours and it, 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 it lacks some of the bells and whistles of the really, really expensive tools that the likes of councils subscribe to. So it doesn't have API integration with other tools, um, but it exists as, as you say, Greg, as the asset register, but also as a tool that drives the maintenance activities that, you know, things like cleaning out your gutters, getting your fire safety equipment inspections, your yep. testing and tagging for electrical items, things like that, that aren't necessarily front of mind and can often fall off the bottom uh, because other things like putting, you know, uniforms on the kids to get them out on the playing field takes precedence. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a tool that's built specifically for community organizations. And it, it's got, as Michael touched on in that brief video, some reporting tools that enables you to set a date, a, a date range and say between the 1st of July this year and the 30th of June next year, tell me all of the maintenance activities that we're going to have to do and tell me what the cost of those activities is going to be. So therefore you can do your budgeting based on that report that it spits out. Yep. No worries. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Greg. Any other questions? Hi, Steve and everyone. Uh, Lee from Council here again. Um, just a couple of things I'd like to say. Um, thank you all for joining us, first and foremost. Um, just in regards to the template, I really, really encourage you to get as many people involved as you can in filling that out, brainstorming through these sessions and, and thinking about what's going to work for your organisation is really going to provide a lot of benefit um, in working out what um, actions that you need to put in place to make that plan really feasible when it comes time, because we know when those times do hit, there's not a lot of time for thinking and sometimes our brains can get a little bit foggy. So having that all detailed as much as you can, I think is going to be really beneficial. And it also helps make um, everyone involved in it more uh, aware of, you know, what sort of processes to go through when that time happens. And also once it is complete, um, printing out, you know, one or more copies, having one in the lunchroom, having them hanging on the notice board, having them really available for people to have a look through that um, might not necessarily be in the uh, building 
part of that phase when you're putting it all together but having it there available so people can have a look at it because the more people who are aware of what needs to happen when and who to contact and things like that it's really going to make that uh, imminent situation much more feasible and much more um, proactive in, in getting everything done so do get everyone involved in your group and do make it available for everyone. And I, I really think and I hope that it's going to, um, you know, help, help save you in that time of crisis to know what needs to be happening. And it just makes it a much more, uh, I won't say enjoyable, but um, much more, you know, proactive situation at the time. So uh, that's what I've got on that, I think. Thank you, Lee. That's yeah, and that's a really good point that we we don't want to um, yeah burden those who've even taken the time to turn up this evening. But um, creating that that working group, as Michael was talking through, or even you know sharing the the process with others, will lead to a far better informed plan as well. Uh, so as as well as the resources that Michael's talked through and as well as the recordings of, of these two sessions also available at the links on council's website and on CPR groups website uh, will be uh, recordings of some interviews that we're doing with local community organizations. So I've met and interviewed a couple of organizations already, and that has led to the sharing of some really valuable insight regarding what those organizations have learned from their experiences of uh, dealing with natural disaster. But we have capacity to, uh, to, to meet with other organizations and to capture an interview. So uh, I, I figured it was a great opportunity this evening to put the call out for any of your organizations who are joining us online if you think that your organization has uh, some experiences and some learning outcomes that you could share for the benefit of other organizations in the uh, spirit of networking and information sharing, you can either let us know now that you might be interested or you can contact us at info at cprgroup.com.au or give us a call and we'll be really happy to loop you into that process and to, to showcase your organization and what it's learned and, um, and to share those experiences with others. So is there anyone that might be interested in having your organization showcased? I thought I might get radio silence in a group session like this, but like I say, either shoot us an email uh, or give us a call on 1800 100 204 and we can uh, coordinate a time that might suit. It's now 8.03 and I promised that we would be finished by eight. So I must apologize. <laughs> um, but this oh, is- If I can impossible. just say, yeah. <laughs> if I can just jump in and say one more thing, sorry, Lee again for yeah. the council. Um, just um, for the organizations joining us now or watching this recording, if um, you need any help with the form, while I super encourage uh, you and the people who are working on it to go through as much as that as you possibly can. If you do need clarification on anything or you do need a little bit of help uh, just finalising that off, then please feel free to contact us on that Sport and Rec email and we can set up a time to have a chat um, because we do want to support you through this as much as possible and we know sometimes things might be a little bit unclear and of course we're here to help you and clarify those things for you so please reach out to us uh, at any stage thanks great and and in the coming uh, week or so for those organizations online tonight council will send you an email prompting you to schedule or get in contact uh, with us directly at CPR group to schedule in your one-on-one -on -one consultation session. So we'll make it as easy as possible, we'll, you know, along with council, we'll get that information in front of you uh, and, and hopefully we'll look forward in the coming weeks to catching up with uh, all of your organizations and wonderful volunteers one-on-one. -on -one. There's nothing else that anyone would like to add. We can leave it there and I will very much look forward to seeing your happy smiling faces in the coming weeks. And thanks again uh, on behalf of the team at CPR Group to Moreton Bay Regional Council for 
putting on this initiative, running this program for the benefit of local community organisations and also for enabling us to continuing our work together, to continue our work together through delivery of the program. We love our work with Moreton Bay community organisations. I think the Moreton Bay region has some of the most passionate volunteers with which we have worked and we really genuinely value the opportunity to help make your lives just a little bit easier. Very good. All right. Well, thank you all very much for your time. I wish you all the very best for the rest of your evenings and I look forward to seeing you one-on-one -on -one before too long. Thank you very much. Good idea. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks again. Bye.